Hi, and welcome to the Design Systems Podcast. This podcast is about the place where design and development overlap. We talk with experts to get their point of view about trends in design, code, and how it relates to the world around us. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Knapsack. Check us out at knapsack.cloud. If you want to get in touch with the show, ask some questions, or generally tell us what you think, go ahead and tweet us at the DSPod. We'd love to hear from you. Hey everyone, Chris here with the Design Systems Podcast. Today I'm with Christoph Gutsukis. He manages the Design Systems Social Club. He's an ADP list mentor. Spent tons of time working in design systems kind of all over the place. You self-describe as a hybrid where you do a lot of design and engineering work. Um, welcome to the program. Stoked you're here. Thanks. And thanks for having me, Chris. Very nice to be there today. We have this uh, wonderful pattern of inviting people on that are French that happen to have skills in both design (laughs) and engineering. Why do you think that is? Why is it that we end up with so many people that either are from France or speak French in that design and engineering crossover? (laughs) So for the French part, I'm not so sure. One thing that I know, though, is like, at least for me, like being a hybrid, I think you're like naturally interested in the design system world because it's just, you know, like there's not that many roles when you get to actually have, you know, like still a foot in each world, you know, like being in design and in development and making sure that, you know, like you're still like part of both worlds. There's not a ton of roles really where you get to do that. And so I think that this is why I see a lot of hybrids naturally going in in that path and that career. For the French spark, I don't know. <laughs> Well, this is a good segue into the conversation. So we were talking a couple of weeks ago about how you got to where you are, which is an interesting and sort of fun story about intentionally or unintentionally creating a a community in your wake of people that are interested in design systems and a lot of folks that are, are very much across disciplines that you like to work with. And so this is an episode that's really about that. It's about the creation of community. And I'm I'm curious to know how you came to be in this position where you have this community that's really wonderful that's sprung up around you and how that's really been a natural extension of who you wanted to work with. So tell us your story. Yeah, sure. We talked about it already. So yes, I'm French. And, you know, like a good chunk of my career was actually in France. And actually in the same company for like 14 years, which seems, you know, crazy, but I basically evolved with the digital space. And so I started as a multimedia developer. So think about, you know, like building websites, flash games or flash applications, you know, like all that good stuff. And then I moved to become like a webmaster when it meant that you were doing everything from design, you know, like... I kind of missed that title, you know? Yeah. Like, that was, a, that was a fun title for a while. <laughs> yeah, but it also meant that you were covering a lot of ground, unfortunately. So I remember, you know, like, taking pictures, interviewing people, and, you know, like, filming them, and, like, doing community management and stuff like that. And to the point where I couldn't just do it all by myself, so I started to build a team around me. I ended up being the head of the web division there. You know, it was really fun, especially because I was working for this National Cultural Institute in France about music, and I'm a musician. So obviously, it was, you know, a great way to do both, you know, and be like in a place where I was, you know, geeking out big time and also like geeking out about music at the same time, which was, you know, very fortunate for me. But the other reality was that Especially at that time, you know, like, I don't want to age myself, but that was some time ago. And so Twitter was already there. And that was kind of like my sole source of what was happening, you know, because I was in France, like in my company, I was the expert, which, you know, feels good most of the time. But at the same time, it's very isolating because nobody else know really like what you're talking about or, you know, like how you can (laughs) like improve stuff. And so I feel like the first community that I was part of although much more of a stalker at that point is just like following the right people on Twitter was the one way for me to actually knowing what was happening, you know, and obviously like mostly geared towards like Silicon Valley and, you know, this kind of stuff and this kind of people. And yeah. I always love a good social media story because there's so many bad social media stories. (laughs) And I, I personally am not the best at social media. It's never been the place that's like really pulled me in or that I've gravitated towards, but It's always great when you hear somebody that is basically feeling the sense, like maybe not personally, but career-wise of needing mentorship, right? And going and finding the voices in 
their space that are talking about the things that they're interested in. And I, I think that's cool. Like, that's a neat way. It's a good, positive, like, like heartwarming story about using Twitter, which those are few and far between right now. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like probably at the beginning of Twitter, it was more like that, right? Because like you have this pattern in social media where when you have a new social media and, you know, like people are willing to actually try it out and it's a very small community at first. So that means also that people are very reachable at that point. So you can talk directly with that guy who wrote that book, you know, like this is awesome. Like this is, you know, like an opportunity for anybody to be able to get to the source, you know, directly. And obviously as the social media grows, then there's more and more people, more and more requests. So like suddenly like those thought leaders, wherever the field you are in, are the less available because like it doesn't scale, right? And so like being there early is the right way to actually make connection, grow in your network, but also have your, you know, like your question answered directly by the right person. Yeah, no, as a, as a sort of like funny aside, you know, I was a part of one of the early universities that got Facebook a little before most of the world got Facebook. And I remember really enjoying it back in the day. And then I always joke with my parents and mom and dad, if you're listening to this, I'm sorry. My parents ruined Facebook for me, <laughs> where like the moment they were on there, <laughs> yeah. I was like, ah, oh, no, like, I got to be done with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, funny, like my version of that story is the fact that, uh, so my wife is American, obviously, I'm French. And so she was on Facebook. And as, you know, like, I want to say, you know, like a webmaster, like going in that thing, like I was super interested about it, like when it was still locked to just colleges. And I was like, I want to get in. Like, tell me when it's in, like when I can. And she was like, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure I want you to see like all the pictures I was taking, you know, like when it was just like a college crowd, you know, and like seeing her, you know, like, I don't know, like partying hard with her friends or something like that. So I feel like I was on the other, <laughs> I, I think right, basically side experienced of both, <laughs> both sides of this, you know, I was like, I want in. And then they were like, oh, I am out. I'm so out. <laughs> Gone. Yeah. So you find this community via Twitter. A lot of that community is based in, in Silicon Valley in California. Where do things go from there? Yeah. So at some point, again, because my wife is American, she works for Google Paris at that time. And then she has a job opportunity in the Silicon Valley. So, you know, like Google HQ, cool, great gig. And we always said, you know, like one day we would love to try to see if what we like best, you know, like living in France or living in the US. So, you know, we're like, well, that's finally like one clear opportunity and given what i do you know like silicon valley is probably the best place in the us for me to find a job okay cool and this is when i started to have the other like another experience with communities because suddenly i was in silicon valley and i was able to just go to meetups and meet in person the people that i was following on twitter right and like their blogs and stuff like that and well, you know, the French connection is, is at it again. But I remember distinctively one of the first meetups that I went was the SaaS meetup. So it's SaaS Mixin. And one of the first person that I met there was Kelig. So Kelig Delumo Prigent, which is now, you know, like like the co-lead of, you know, the design token W3C, uh, what is it, yeah, working group? He was, he, was, he was just on the podcast too. I'm really glad you said his last name and not me. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Sounds better when you say it. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, like, again, like, take it from me, who basically, I, I'm guessing we're not that many people, but he wrote a book about, like, maintaining CSS and SAS in French. And I read his book before meeting him. And so, you know, it was, like, so funny and, and somewhat, like, incredible because, obviously, very small, you know, like, community, very small group of people. But at the same time, you're like, hey, I read your book, you know, and I can talk to you directly about it and ask you questions and stuff like that. And so that was great. But, you know, like in that meetup, I think I met Gina Ain. <laughs> I met Empton, Kathleen, like the actual creator of SaaS, you know, like I think I met not the first one, but again, like SaaS Mixing, I met Nathan Curtis, you know, like it's, it was just a great opportunity to like meet all those people that I was following for years and, you know, like being able to say, hey, cool, you know, like I can ask you questions and we can talk about stuff and you're interested in what I have to say too. And, uh, you know, it just feels great, you know, like to be able to actually be part of that community. Uh, it's, it's interesting too, to basically be able to meet 
these folks that are doing the thing that you look at as mentors, that you look at as, you know, the early leaders of this community. I think it's also funny that it wasn't even really a design system meetup. Um, it was something that was, was you know, tangential to it. But the ability to go in and chat with all those people and spend time around them, I assume the feeling there was pretty cool. Yeah. And I want to actually make a parallel with my previous job back in France, because, again, I was working for this cultural, like it's a national cultural institute about music, which means that there was concerts, which means that there were internationally renowned artists coming to play there, right? And I'm part of the crew. I'm like backstage, right? I'm like, you know, like I'm interviewing people or taking pictures for the website or, you know, like all that stuff. And this is also where you basically understand that all those people that you can admire in some ways because, you know, like they wrote this book that is brilliant or they make that talk that is great or they are, you know, like renowned artists. Cool. They're on stage. There's the spotlight. You know, everybody's applauding them and stuff like that. Cool. The next minute when they're exiting the stage and you're backstage and, you know, like it's like poorly lit and they're exhausted and it's the <laughs> end of their day and they want to take a shower or go to the bathroom. Instantly, they become human again. And that's basically the parallel that I want to make is that like, yes, of course, you can meet like brilliant people that are really like making things move and thought leader and stuff like that. But I think it basically also taught me that, you know, those people are human. You know, they can be your friends too, or, you know, like you're going to have just like a normal conversation with those people because they're like you. And so I think that part of my energy or my will to make communities is also to, I don't know if it's the right word in English, but desacralize the fact that, you know, like all those thought leaders or, you know, like people that have done awesome stuff, like they're struggling too. Like they have problems, you know, like it, they're not perfect. And so, you know, it's, so it's all about like, hey, we're all humans and we're all in it together and, you know, we can talk to each other. It's fun. And it's normal. Thank you, by the way, for being understanding that my five-year-old was melting down and didn't want to go to school today. And that's why I was 10 minutes late to starting this podcast. <laughs> like, <laughs> But that's my point, right? It's like, we're humans. Yeah. No, I mean, r real life happens around like the curated social media feeds. And I think that that's like, that's one of the things that I've always like really struggled with, with community is there is like this kind of twofold thing, right? I was in the Drupal community for a long time. And I remember the first time I met Dries, the creator of Drupal. And like, that was an intimidating moment for me. I was very early on in my career. I was in my early 20s. You know, I didn't really know what I was doing yet in the web space. And he was a very welcoming, kind person. And then I ended up working for him for almost three years. And, you know, in those moments of authenticity, that's where you kind of like, you know, find that sense of community. I think that like the more curated stuff it's useful, right? You learn things on Twitter. You learn things from blogs. You learn things, you know, surfing medium and reading interesting articles. But where like that connection happens, that's when you go and sit and, you know, have a beer and see that person like maybe with some bags under their eyes talking about how hard it is to start a company or, you know, how much they've been struggling with getting adoption of design tokens or something like that. Yeah. And the other thing to think about is, or just to remind you of, is that it's not because you're an expert in one domain that you are an expert in every domain. And so basically those people that are, you know, expert in that domain probably have a thing or two to learn from you. You know, it's been a long time since I think, and I'm going to be like maybe a nerd about this, but I think Leibniz was the last personality to be like all science, you know, like kind of expert where, you know, like he was like a mathematician, a philosopher, you know, like doing like all the stuff and all the research <laughs> and stuff like that. Like it's long gone since like somebody, a human can actually be all those things at the same time. Right. And so you also have to remember that, you know, like if you're an expert in one domain, you still have like things to learn from other people. I think it, you know, it's just levels up everybody and say, yeah, we're all no stuff and ignorant of other stuff. And that's normal. Or at least for me, it's like, the point is like, we should learn from each other constantly. No, I completely agree. It's one of the reasons why I love doing this, right? Is it's funny now, like people will recognize me, mostly recognize my voice because uh, there's not a lot of video of me on the internet, but they'll recognize my voice from the podcast. and They'll be like, oh, hey, you're the host of the Design Systems Podcast. And I'm always like, a little embarrassed by that. Like it, it makes <laughs> yeah. me uncomfortable a little bit because I don't want that to be the persona I project. I'd rather it be like much more like, you know, who I am authentically. Not that this podcast is inauthentic. But then there's all of this other wonderful stuff where like I get to talk to people like you and all these other people in this great community. 
and really start to build something around that where ideally we learn from each other and we're in this situation where we make a community better. It's also why we really try to keep this podcast like somewhat separate from the knapsack side of things. Like I, I don't talk a lot about the company that I've started on this, largely because I want this to feel like a learning moment between people having a conversation. And that's how I think about building community. But you've done a lot of this too. And what I really want to understand is like we've talked a lot about like, okay, this is how I participate in communities. But you've actually also like built a lot of these yourself. So talk to me about how you sort of made this transition from this guy that, you know, uh, just arrived in Silicon Valley, meeting all these incredible people to actually like starting these things yourself. Because I think that's also really interesting. Okay, sure. Well, when I'm thinking about it, I think there's a couple of things at play. One, I think maybe the most important one is that my love language is like professionally is to share knowledge. And so when I learn something cool, I want to share it with somebody else. You know, like through my career, I met a ton of people that are, you know, like passionate or specialized in one thing or another. Every time I see something cool in that field, I will reach out to them and say, hey, I found this thing. It's pretty cool. Like, I, do you know it? What do you think? Check it out. You know, maybe it's because also, you know, like back in France when I was, you know, just the receiver or like, you know, in that isolating spot where, you know, like I didn't have like a lot of people to talk to, but and it's like, it's my natural inclination to just like share that knowledge with people. You know, like I see something interesting, I want them to know too. And I think it's, you know, it's all about like sharing knowledge. So that's one. Second part is I'm also a musician and I'm not shy to be on stage. I'm not shy, you know, like to talk and, you know, like basically be the front man. And so I feel like, you know, like driving a community is also somewhat like being in the forefront and trying to, you know, like build stuff, you know, like when you build a band, it's actually a lot of work, but it's also like, or at least the way I see it is that when I was, you know, leading bands, it was never like to be the star. It was like, I wanted to build like a good band, like making good music. There's nothing better for me than being on stage when, you know, like it clicks between everybody, you know, you're doing something great. You can like have eye contact and everybody's smiling because you're doing something awesome. And then you also have the feedback from the crowd and like people are actually digging what you're doing. This is the best for me. Like there's nothing that tops that feeling at that moment. And so it's again, all about like creating something together. I think that's really what drives me. And like I said, you know, like I'm not shy to like present people and present stuff and like being in the spotlight. You know, I've done that since I was what, 15 or 16, something like that. I make mistakes. I, you know, like I can, can do like, you know, like I can like not find my words and stuff like that, or, you know, like mispronounce something. It's all right. It's okay. You know, it's like I, I'll move on and, you know, the show must go, go on and stuff like that. So that's that. Now, very practically, at that time, I started to <laughs> very also selfishly and a little bit laziness for me, but, you know, like, so I'm in the Silicon Valley. I'm actually in the South Bay of the Silicon Valley. And most of the meetups that are happening are in San Francisco. And the traffic is just horrendous. You know, it's like you have to drive for at least an hour <laughs> to just get there, you know, for the SaaS mix in or for, you know, like that meetup. By the way, one of the greatest experiences that I had as a community for design systems specifically is the design system Wednesdays. That was first created by a guy called LB Barber. So LB, if you hear this, thanks, because that was awesome what you did there. And it was very informal. Just I want to make sure that I'll say that too, because LB created it, but now it's actually run by Maria Egilus. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, Maria. You know, like apologize in advance if I didn't. But this Design System Wednesdays is very informal. It's basically a monthly meetup for design system practitioner. There's no agenda. We just meet on a Zoom call or before we were actually, it was even better because before COVID, we were meeting every month in a different company. And it was just like between anywhere between like five people and 30 people in different companies each time, you know, like in a big, you know, like conference room. And we were just chatting and showing each other what we were working on and you know, talking about the struggles that we had and stuff like that. And so like, that was great. The way you speak about that, it makes me really feel like you miss it a lot. Well, it's online and it's still active. So I was actually yesterday, <laughs> the last one. So I was there. Yeah, yeah. But but like the idea of going from place to place and oh, kind yeah. of like, that was like awesome. seeing people like where they are. I personally, I really miss that too, right? Like there's a little projection there, certainly, where 
I miss meeting people sort of in their environment talking about the stuff live. You know, Zoom is great. Other tools are great. It's not quite the same, though. Yeah. Well, for me, it was, yeah, two things. One is like in-person meeting is just so much better for communication, but also being able to check out each other places, you know, like offices, companies, like how you do things that, you know, oh, yeah, I like the architecture of this building or something like that, you know, like just going to a new place, I think is fun. But to go back to my previous point, you know, like most of the time it was like pretty far away. And I was like, wait a minute, you know, it's like, where's South Bay? There's a lot of major companies, you know, like startups and stuff like that that are here. Why don't we have like more meetups in the area for people that are here, you know? And so we don't have to actually commute to San Francisco or San Jose every time we want to meet. And so this is when I started to like make that idea, like I want to create my own meetup. And so I did. And it was called The Interface, and it was for designers and developers. And the company that I was at at that point, ThoughtSpot, they were actually kind enough and willing to actually sponsor the whole thing. It was like a monthly meetup. I, you know, invited guests to talk. And then I also tried to design the meetup a little bit. So, you know, you had like a first part where somebody was talking about something, you know, Q&A, pretty classic. And then after that, We also had like somewhat of a network event. So there was a couple of things that you could do. There was this like collaborative art project where it was just like a big whiteboard and everybody who came, you know, like if you had a sticker that was not already on the board, you can just add it to the thing. So like month after month, it grew and stuff like that. The other thing that was, I think, pretty cool is that we had like different tables and on each table, we had a conversation starter. So, you know, you had like a theme for that table. So like if you wanted to talk about accessibility, you knew like you know you can go like directly to that table. And that was because I hate the fact that, you know, when you're in a networking event and you know you don't know anybody and you just have their names and it's kind of like a hit or miss. You know, it's like, hey, what do you want to talk about? Yeah. And I'm a back end engineer. I'm like, this is cool. I mean, I love that for you, but I have nothing to tell you. You know, it's like I'm like so different from you than I'm happy to meet you, but at the same time, I feel like we're going to kind of like, you know, struggle to get to an interesting spot. Whether like, you know, like just starting the conversation was just a good way for me to just, you know, like get things going. And so I did that for a while at that company. And to be honest with you, you know, there were like multiple reasons to make that happen. You know, it's like you grow your network, you can maybe recruit people for, you know, like the company that I was working for. It's a great way to grow the people there because, you know, like every new meetup was a good occasion to know more about, you know, like the theme that we were talking about or things like that. It was for designers and developers. And the last thing it was like, it was actually putting our company on the map in Silicon Valley because, you know, it's like, hey, we're still a startup and we're pretty new and nobody really knows us. So it was a great way, you know, to get like the brand out and stuff like that. And yeah, it was pretty successful. I think when, you know, COVID hit, I stopped, but uh, it was like, over 500 people from that area, you know? And so, you know, it's like, is it a big number, a small number? The point is that like every month they were like a good crowd. And at some point, like the numbers don't really matter all that much, right? It's about the idea of getting the people that want to be together talking about this stuff, taking time out of their day. I mean, it's funny. The last time I was deeply involved in meetups, I had one child and did not yet have a funded startup company. (laughs) And so the idea of like what it would look like then versus now and like the time commitment of the people that would come to those conversations. But I I mean, I think this this drives at the purpose, right? People taking time out of their lives and their day to share knowledge with one another. And if people get value out of it, meetups grow and and more people come and they connect with one another and, and that's where the kind of the magic happens. I think that this kind of drives at like why all this stuff matters. And a big part of the reason why I wanted you to be on here to tell your story is we've all kind of been missing this sense of community now for a little while. And I really desperately want to restart that. And and we're trying in little ways, you know, NAFSAC, we run the patterns conference and we've been trying to do a bunch of local patterns events with folks like Meta in San Francisco. You know, we've had an event in Chicago. We're about to have one in Portland, but trying to really figure out a way that we can help in the community to provide that sponsorship, right? Like to help people start an event. And so if you're interested, hit us up. I'd be curious to talk to you about, you know, you or any of our listeners about how we restart these things. Because 
I view this as essential for the success of design systems, right? Like you talking about that meetup in San Francisco where you met all these amazing people and that's kind of like led you to where you are now. I think there's a lot of people that are absent that at this moment. And I'd love to start to see this stuff pop up in person a lot more again. Yeah, I think it's interesting because, well, first of all, that's kind of like what I tried to do after. So the interface died because of COVID, you know, and I actually changed jobs and stuff like that. And I was at that point also relying heavily on another community, which was started by Gina Ain is the design system Slack workspace, which is probably like the most thriving, I think, Slack community around design system by far. You know, there's like thousands of people now that, that are on that network, right? And so I basically had this support group that I made, you know, like that were ultimately like they're my friends now, you know, like, but it's very also funny how it started because again, you know, like design system Wednesdays every month, it's in a different location. And it turns out that there's just a group of friends that we were pretty much like all the same, you know, like in the same area. So we started to say, hey, do you want a carpool? Because, you know, like it's stupid to have like the five of us driving five cars to go to exactly the same place. So, you know, like we started to like do like a, you know, design system, carpool, karaoke kind of vibe. And so this is how, you know, like I had like those friends and then we were, you know, like more or less like every day talking together on that Slack group, you know, like having our private discussion, all five of us. And, you know, we all work in different companies at different roles, but we're all struggling with design system, you know, like in the same way. So we were just asking each other, but it is really like a support group. And at some point we were like, well, I think other people could benefit from the conversation that we have because we have like enough interesting people here have with like different background, different opinions, different roles, you know, like different companies. And so this is when I feel like I don't even remember who got the idea first, but you were like, hey, maybe we should like do a podcast about it. And then this idea moved on to like, hey, let's do a live stream. You know, it's like, let's like do it live. So like people can actually ask us questions directly. So that's how the Design System Social Club was born. But the idea was to say, hey, real talk. You know, it's like the vibe is that there are, you know, like I'm not the one who is going to tell you how it is. Like, I don't know, but I have questions too. And I'm, you know, like I have my own experience and I have like people coming to the show and we have like a theme and stuff like that. But like we all give our own opinion about this. And the idea is to make it real. You know, it's like everybody's struggling. Don't think that somebody had all figured it out because that's not true. Even at Google, even at, you know, like Shopify, even at Atlassian, you like all those, you know, big names and big design systems. Like, yeah, of course, you know, like they've done incredible work, but that doesn't mean that they, you know, they know everything far from it. And they're also struggling. And so the idea was to say, hey, look at us. We're also trying to figure it out together and ask us questions. And so that was the idea of the Design System Social Club now. It was very, you know, like grassroots oriented. You know, it's like, it's just pretty much like me now at that point. It's just a bunch of people that wanted to get together in front of a microphone. I totally understand that. Yeah, but that said, like this has been on pause now for some time because I also noticed that there's more and more content that actually also sponsored by, you know, like Napsat, for example, you know, like you have like <laughs> way more means than me by myself. So it's not like I want to stop, but I was like, hey, I need to figure out like a new way to actually engage with people. And this is also where I started to do like more mentorship on ADP list platform, right? And so it's like a one-on-one. It's nice. And, you know, like I want to say like two-thirds of the mentor session that I have is around design system and people like trying to figure out how do they need to do this. Okay, cool. But that doesn't really scale. So I'm like back at like, should I do like some kind of like office hours where people can come and ask questions and have, you know, again, guests that can answer because I don't want to be the only, like, I don't know, I would feel weird to just like be the only one who has like knowledge and can like tell you about stuff. But, you know, this, this idea of like, I, I need to like reinvent the way because like just talking about one topic, you know, like if I do like another, like, hey, accessibility and design system. This is super cool, like, and I talk about it for hours, but I feel like there's other players now that can do this kind of stuff, and uh, maybe I can do something that is more 
direct and more like, you know, like Q&A or office hours kind of vibe. No, absolutely. I would love to collaborate on something like that. I think that, you know, this kind of gets into the the last thing that I wanted to hit on, right, is how we think about growing and evolving this community. How do we elevate other people's voices? I mean, look, my stake in this, like, yes, I have a startup that sells software related to design systems. But my stake in this is one of the happiest career pathways I ever took on was being a part of a pretty large and substantial open source community. And I loved that. And it was really, really great to connect with those people and to build genuine, real, authentic friendships based on the people you work around. And to also have all those people not have the same logo on their shirt when they'd all get together in the same place. And so for me, like, I agree, right? There's a lot more corporate voices in the space of design systems now, more than there's ever been. I want to try to figure out how to maintain some of that ideology or some of that identity as something that is distinct from my startup, but as a member of this community. And I'm completely down to collaborate around that. And please, if you're listening to this and you have ideas for collaboration, let me know. Because I also struggle with like, what form does this take, right? You know, the podcast has been great. And I love doing this work. Like this is some of the highlights of my week is when I get to record episodes like this. But trying to figure out how we actually get into people's cities and into people's you know office buildings without necessarily like a mic and an internet connection I'm interested in that too. And so trying to figure out like what we do, I feel like that local commitment is important of getting the people in your local area and in your local community. And I also think about figuring out how you can have something that like, like, look, this ends up being a pretty two-way conversation, right? Like we talk with each other, we learn from each other, and then we send that out into the world and hopefully other people get value out of it and learn from it. But how do we have those things in a like a more forum-based or or like you said, office hours-based format? All these are great ideas of where this goes. And it also gives us opportunities as the people that are building it to, you know, elevate the people that really help make it special. I think it's interesting and somewhat meta because ultimately design systems are about building a community in your own organization. So it just makes sense for people interested in design system to actually be part of communities because ultimately that's really what we're doing, right? And so when you have, you know, like people like Gina Ayn saying, hey, design systems are for people, that's the point, right? It's like the idea is to create a community, a mind hive, you know, it's like, how do we make people work together between different roles? And, you know, like I often compare my role as a design system lead as, you know, like a head coach of a professional team. You know, it's like the idea is not, I'm not going to tell you how to be a good developer. That's not my role. My role is to make sure that I give you like the tools and resources to actually work well as a team all together and to be successful together. And so again, the idea is building community, making sure that people, you know, like are inc- feel included and feel safe and they can talk and they can, you know, participate and contribute back to the system. Like this is all community. I mean, to me, like it makes sense that design system communities are, you know, things that should be thriving because, well, that's what we're about actually in the end. And the other thing that I just wanted to say is that when I said, you know, like there's like more and more basically companies that are sponsoring stuff, I think it's a good, it's great. It's just that, you know, like they have the means to actually do stuff of quality when I feel like apart from like Gina who created Clarity from scratch on her own, you know, like our probably on our own dime. Like, I don't know how she does it, but I can't. It's an unbelievable undertaking. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, like, what is the expression? Like, tip on my hat or something like that? You know, being Yeah, person. hat tip. <laughs> hat tip right? yeah. to her because, yeah. like, this is incredible. And also, she's an incredible community leader because I feel like this, you know, like the design system Slack community, it's great. It's inclusive. You know, it's like people are actually not assholes, you know, like encounter, you know, like a bad interaction. Maybe, you know, I would just went lucky, but I feel like overall, like this community is actually good people talking. I completely agree. I've had almost entirely positive interactions with people that have been a part of design systems and the eagerness and the willingness to learn. I think that that's why it's important that we continue to grow this. No. And so, yeah, to go back to your point, you know, it's like if we can like combine this appetite from, you know, like design system people to actually build more events and stuff like that. And, you know, combine that with the means of like companies and stuff that are willing to sponsor this kind of stuff. Yeah, I think we can actually get to a very interesting place for sure. 
Well, hey, Kristoff, really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming in and telling us your story, talking about community with me. And I'm really looking forward to collaborating with you. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So let's stay in touch. And you know, maybe in the next month or so, let's try to get in front of a mic again in a different format and see what we can experiment with. Oh, I'm game. Definitely game. Thanks, Chris, for having me. And as usual, you know, like talking about design system is probably the highlight of my day. So thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, hey, have a great rest of your week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Catch you later. That's all for today. This has been another episode of the Design Systems Podcast. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or a topic you'd like to know more about, find us on Twitter at the DS Pod. We'd love to hear from you with show ideas, recommendations, questions, or comments. As always, this pod is brought to you by Knapsack. You can check us out at knapsack.cloud. Have a great day.